Good afternoon. Hi, welcome to Diplomacy Classroom. My name is Lauren Fisher and I'm the Education Director for the National Museum of American Diplomacy. And thank you for joining us for a Facebook Live event. Um, just to mention, this is our first Facebook Live event. So if there should be any glitches, uh, technically, just hang in there with, with us. We're on it. We're going to smooth things out. But thank you for joining us this afternoon for a, an exploration into diplomacy. Um, and also, happy uh, Teacher Appreciation Week. Um, we have been thinking so much about our teachers, not only for what you normally do, but in this time of preparing lessons to be presented virtually, we've been thinking a lot about you. So we wanted to share what we have to offer you that we think will help you um, in engaging your students in US government, in economics, in history, in uh, current events. So we look forward to sharing with you um, what we have. I will be um, presenting this afternoon with my colleague and our public historian, Dr. Allison Mann. She will be presenting later into the program. Um, I also wanted to give a nod to the National History Day teachers who are out there. Uh, I realize that you are already thinking about the 2021 uh, competition theme, which is communication in history. So as we move through um, our tour of our resources today, we'll, we will be hitting that theme of communication. Um, and I am delighted that we, um, that actually Dr. Allison Mann um, is a contributing uh, author in the communication and history um, resource guide that has been published by National History Day. So you can look forward to that. So as our program moves today, after our introduction, we will be spending most of the time on our website, looking at what resources are available uh, for you. Then uh, Allison will be presenting a deeper dive and looking into one of our online exhibits. And then we will be opening it up for questions. So as you um, uh, participate with us today, if you can enter your questions in the comment section of the video, we will be addressing and responding those, uh, to those after Allison's presentation. So the National Museum of American Diplomacy, we are a museum that's dedicated to telling the story of diplomacy through stories, through exhibits, through artifact and through public, uh, public programming. We are located at the US Department of State headquarters in Washington, DC. And our mission is to inspire an American public to learn more about diplomacy, the work of our US diplomats abroad and how that their work impacts us here at home. So to learn more about who we are and what we do, I would love to um, turn us now to our website. Our website address is diplomacy.state.gov. So that's one thing you absolutely want to remember here is our web address, diplomacy.state.gov. And here's our homepage. You see a view of our um, preview exhibit called Diplomacy is Our Mission. And here, um, and Allison actually will be offering you a closer look into this preview exhibit that we opened in November. And this is um, um, an introduction to what's to come in our permanent exhibits once we are fully open to the public. As you look at the tabs at the top of the, at the, top of the screen, um, you see we have education, exhibit, collection, and programs. What we have done here today is we've culled through all of what resources exist and put everything on one page for you that I will show you in just a minute. So you are welcome to peruse our website. There's a lot of information here, um, but what is relevant to you, we have located on one page, which is under exhibits, but before, I mean, I'm sorry, under education. Um, but, and actually let's go to education right now. And for those teachers joining us today, if you are, or any teacher who is interested or comes to Washington, D.C., we would love to, to welcome you or your students in. So if you go to that education tab, which is, a drop, what is, down, which is a drop down, um, you will see attend a program. Um, but, and actually, let's go to education right now. And for those 
Teachers. And if you hit attend a program um, and scroll down, you will get information. If we scroll down a little bit of attend a program on under education. Oh, let's see, do we have a drop down? Attend a program. Yes, there we go. If we want to click that and we want to scroll down, we will see information about the various programs that we offer on site as well as how you can plan a um, plan a visit. So once things are up and running and we are open again, and if you are interested in visiting us um, on site, please, you want to go to our Tend to Program to learn more about that. But for now, what I would like to do is go back to that education tab and go to resources at a glance. And this is where we will be spending most of our time today. So if we scroll down this page under resources, you will see there's a lot here. First, we have a diplomacy at a glance section that really looks at the basic information about who we are as the Department of State, who our diplomats are, what they do, where they do it, the issues that they engage. We also have some um, accompanying uh, videos that help to bring that information to life. If you keep scrolling, you will see that we also have videos that allow you to explore with your students a little bit more about issues, including wildlife trafficking, migration, oceans and fisheries, freshwater and counterfeit trade. And it, um, the, the videos behind there, there's about four or five or six videos that are short that explore how a diplomat engages in, in that, uh, that that global issue. And then at the bottom, we have three sections. We have a dig deeper with online exhibits, which we will take a, a closer look um, a little later. We also have, as a museum, we have over 9,000 objects. So we have some um, wonderful stories uh, connected to some of our objects that you can find here. And then practice diplomacy. This section links you to our diplomacy simulation program, which is an in class program that after you've explored the basics of who we are and what we do as the State Department and US diplomats, you can invite your students to be that diplomat and through a live simulation program where they exercise the skills of diplomacy, they're invited to negotiate a solution to a hypothetical, uh, a hypothetical global crisis. But for now, I'm gonna lead us back up to the top of the page where we can look at diplomacy at a glance because really what is here are the nuts and bolts of who we are and what we do. Um, and as you explore with your students the online, the online exhibits or the collection or the simulation program, it's wonderful to be able to offer them a little bit about the State Department what we do, why we do it, uh, and the work of the diplomats. And that's all in this diplomacy at a glance section here. We try to write um, the text in digestible chunks. This information, you can grab that link and send it right to your students. This is not only great information for you as the educator to learn more about our work, but we've designed it so you can share directly that page with your students so they can better understand what we do. So you see the first question as an example, is what is the mission of the State Department? We're a federal agency that represents the United States abroad in international relations. So you, you have that information there, um, as well as the pillars of American diplomacy. And you will, you will over again hear sort of how we've, we've organized our content under the security and peace, prosperity, democracy and development. You'll, you'll hear those words over again. But, but actually, for the, for the moment, I would like to look at the, the second question of how does the US Department of State engage with other countries? So if we click here, it brings us to a page. If we, yep, yeah, there we go. How does the State Department engage with other countries? So this is an example that behind each of those blue links, you will see a page of information that describes more of 
the work of the department. And as you look at the text, you will see that certain words are um, in blue. And if you hover over that, those words are defined. So in this particular area here, we really explore that notion of what is diplomacy and how does the United States build relationships with other countries. We also um, explore in this page what a bilateral relationship means, which is our relationship with one other country, bi meaning two, lateral meaning sides, and then also the multilateral effort and how the United States works with multilateral organizations such as the UN or NATO. Um, so you have, and also what this particular page um, includes is how we work on international issues such as HIV AIDS as an example, um, and how we uh, work with USAID. And if you look to the right, you see additional links that offer additional information for you and your students. So this is easy to pop back out of. And that brings us back to a diplomacy at a glance section here. So as you think about the State Department and what we do abroad through um, how, we, how we develop bilateral and multilateral relationships with other countries, begs the question, who does this work? So we see below a question of who are US diplomats and what do they do? And again, if you click that, um, if you click US diplomats or um, use personal relationships with officials, if you want to click into that, under who are US diplomats and what do they do, right? Yeah, excellent. Um, you'll see, you'll learn roles of how, what, what diplomats do. And here again, as we build these bilateral and multilateral relationships, we're using the art of communication. We need to be able to develop, uh, communicate to develop those relationships, and those are very, very crucial to our work as diplomats. And again, you see the words are highlighted in blue that we feel a student might need um, it more clarification or the def definition of, such as a mission where our diplomats work abroad. And if you keep scrolling um, through that page, you get a sense of just how long this, um, the text is. At the bottom, not in addition to the side, but also at the bottom, you um, have an opportunity to link to further information if your students are so interested in, if they would want to become or interested in a, uh, the role of a diplomat for themselves as a career choice. So we've included those links at the bottom um, for more information and our careers page that is on the State Department's website, um, which is state.gov, has a plethora of information for students to learn about careers in the department. And I just wanted to glance a little bit more if we move up this page to the right again, you see we have additional links that help our students um, dig deeper into these questions. So if we wanna pop back out of this, so again, diplomacy at a glance, these are really the nuts and bolts of who we are and our work. Accompanying the text in those questions, we have four videos, eight minutes in length, roughly each of them, all, um, each of them around a different one of the pillars, the peace security, which is focused in Estonia, the prosperity, which is in Rwanda and Mauritius, democracy, which is was filmed in Peru, and development, which was in Cambodia. Each of these videos interviews diplomats and in sort of brings to life the information that you find in the text behind those questions on the left. Those videos interview diplomats so you get a chance to hear from them and learn not only about the global issue in that country, you begin to learn about the work that that diplomat does on that issue and how that issue, that global issue, impacts us here at home. I will uh, add, because I know this is important for, for teachers who are in the classroom and I know that things are a little different now because so much of us are working out of in, you know, in a virtual space, but all of our videos are hosted on YouTube. So if there's any um, locks that you have on YouTube, I just want you to be aware that we do have a YouTube page where all of our videos live. 
Um, at the top of those videos, you see we do have a little bit of a worksheet there um, that are just some questions which prompt thinking that you can use as you assign your student to view that video to learn more about their government at work on a global issue. You can have them think about these questions that are before you. You can cut and paste them into whatever, um, whatever format that you are using. I want to reiterate that all this is free for you. All you have to do is grab the link, share it with your students. Please, I want you to, um, to, to use this in any way that you feel is appropriate for you and your students in your class. Um, I just want to move down a little bit and show you two other features. Um, actually, before we, hold on, go back up. Let's go back up. Yeah, so I mentioned in those texts that we looked at behind the questions that those blue words were highlight, highlighted with the definition. We do have a complete dictionary there. So feel free to send your students to view all of these sort of words that they may see throughout, not only the, the, the content behind those questions, but as they view any of our online exhibits or information or stories about our collection, because we are telling the stories about the work of our diplomats, it's, it's about um, you know, foreign affairs and foreign relations, so we have those terms defined for you there. Also, as you peruse and, and see what works for you here in terms of this information, we do have a page that, that includes some additional activities and questioning strategies that you can think about and use in creating your own worksheets or your own um, directed looking exercises for your students. And I want to hear some questioning strategies that helps you think about our work and how it relates to these, um, these themes, but also um, I want to scroll down a little bit more to show you some that we do have some activities at the bottom for you to be able to look at. What's, what's, a, what's amazing about teaching about U.S. diplomacy and the State Department is because our diplomats do so many different things, they fulfill so many different roles abroad, they work on so many different global issues, it doesn't matter what you're teaching in the classroom. Um, there's a way to integrate the State Department because we're working on um, refugee issues, non-proliferation, water, fresh water. Uh, we're working on economics and trade, certainly. So let's go back to our diplomacy at a glance. Um, and I want to, uh, I mentioned, let's scroll past the videos that that give you, as I mentioned, we work on so many different issues. There are some videos here that, again, they're short. They're maybe between two, not even, like a minute and a half and two and a half minute long videos about that issue that give you more information about how we work. Great videos designed for student, um, for student viewing. But I just want to focus a little bit on the bottom here. Um, and look at the faces going to the digger, dip, dig deeper with our online exhibits. And I want to highlight our faces of diplomacy exhibit here. And again, that blue foreign service and civil service, what is this? What does this mean? That'll take you to a definition for your students. But this highlights some of our diplomats at work. And I wanted to, um, and there's actually a number of our diplomats that we've highlighted here. Here, um, we have a public affairs officer, um, which includes a video which talks about her work as a public affairs working with, with uh, foreign press abroad. We also, also have a, um, a regional security officer that talks about security efforts um, at, in our U.S. embassies abroad, and then um, an economics officer. So we have, we have a story, we have a video that is a great um, resource for your students to get a, a sort of a deeper look at the work of a diplomat again. But LeMay Kane here, this is a great story of an information management specialist. And this short video, which is less than three minutes, talks about his work and the importance of communication abroad and not only sending uh, cables back to Washington 
or telegrams back to Washington as it was um, in the past, but also talks about the, the, the importance of language and learning languages and communicating with counterparts in the country in which he was, he's working. So really important videos that help to reveal the work of a diplomat. So if we pop out of this um, and again, stay with our online exhibit, really rich information. And if you explore that diplomacy at a glance, basic information about who we are and what we do, that will help your students understand better or, or make these experiences more rich with looking at our online exhibits as well as looking at our collection. But before I invite Allison to join us, um, I wanted to look at the Diplomacy is Our Mission online exhibit, which offers uh, that home page of our website offered sort of a bird's eye view of what this exhibit looks like um, in our museum, but we've posted some of our stories online for you to experience. And again, we see our theme of security um, and prosperity. And I stop on prosperity here because this is the, the story that Allison's going to provide a little, she's going to drill down a little bit more into and offer more information about the uh, Japan's first embassy visit to the United States. So as you move through her presentation, also know that you can come to the Diplomacy is Our Mission online exhibit and find information of that exhibit here under the prosperity theme. And with that, I would love to invite my uh, colleague, the National Museum of American Diplomacy's public historian and my friend, Dr. Allison Mann. Thank you for joining us. Hi, I'm happy to be here. Yay. All right, so I will clue back, uh, come back with Allison at the conclusion of her presentation to respond to any of the questions that we have funneling in, uh, through today. And as Allison's moving through her presentation, please feel free to, to uh, enter into that comment bar any questions that you may have for us. Thanks very much, Lauren. So hopefully I'm Zooming and Facebook living and- Yeah. And I assume if I'm not, somebody will tell me uh, at the museum. So uh, welcome to everybody that joined us today. I want to echo what Lauren said. Happy Teacher Appreciation Day. We appreciate everything that you do, um, especially during this difficult time. And we're so glad uh, that you were able to tune in with us today. So Lauren gave a great introduction. Uh, what I'm going to do now is share my screen, hopefully successfully. And so that you'll be able to see um, my presentation here. And uh, hopefully that's all good. And I'm gonna go into present mode. Um, let's go back to the beginning since I forgot to do that, to the title page. So you know who we are. Um, Lauren gave the introduction. So let's just go right into it. Uh, Lauren showed that picture of Diplomacy is Our Mission there uh, that is inside our museum. And that picture on the right shows you just another view, kind of the backside. And you can see that we've got some iconic uh, secretaries of state and Benjamin Franklin sitting there as our nation's first diplomat. And then I'm going to bring you inside um, one of those, uh, we call them pods, they're circular, and they do focus on those themes that uh, Lauren talked about, security, prosperity, um, the democracy and development. So this is inside the prosperity uh, pod there, and that is our story of Gundo diplomacy. And it is the story of the first uh, Japanese diplomats who came to the United States. And that's what I'm going to dive in a little bit today. And, uh, you know, one of the things I'm sure that a lot of people can appreciate is, you know, how do you take this very complex story, right, and distill it down into a couple of exhibit panels. And you can see we've used imagery in there, some of which you'll see in the presentation as well. 
Okay, so let's just talk for a second about Manifest Destiny, because I'm sure that a lot of you who teach U.S. history cover this in your classroom. And uh, this was a term that was attributed to the guy on the right. His name is John O'Sullivan. He was an editor and a writer, and um, but he never actually used the words Manifest Destiny. It comes from an article from 1838 that was published in um, the United States Democratic Review. And, uh, you know, if you, if those of you use it in the classroom, you know, it's a great primary source for your students to use because it really sort of encapsulates this mindset of the, the burgeoning American public, the idea of expansionism in the pre-Mexican War period. And the article itself was titled The Great Nation of Futurity, which is kind of a mouthful. I don't think I've ever heard anybody use that word. Um, in, in common language. And, um, you know, what he says in the article is really that, uh, you know, it, it's just limitless, the, the expanse of the United States and its reach. Um, just read a quote from it that encapsulates the idea of manifest destiny. He wrote, the expansive future is in our arena and for our history. We are entering on its untrodden space with the truths of God in our minds, beneficent objects in our hearts, and with a clear conscience unsullied by the past. We are the nation of human progress, and who will, what can, set limits to our onward march? So let's talk about that for just a second. Um, we think about uh, you know territorial expansionism. That's often the way that manifest destiny is talked about there, and that image that I provided on the left is you know pretty commonly used as an artistic representation of what manifest destiny meant. You know, it's got the religious connotations. It has uh, you know Lady Liberty sort of going into the darkness. Um, you know, she's bringing light behind her. She's bringing technology behind her. But what I want to uh, introduce maybe is a new way of thinking about how we do talk about manifest destiny in the classroom. So on the left there, there's a depiction of, you know, the very typical, you know, map of the expansion of the United States, adding states to the union, um, you know, uh, talking about slavery and, and all of that, but it's very much uh, territorially, geographically contained to, you know, what we know as the modern United States of America. But to the right there, let's talk a little bit about the Pacific. This is a great opportunity to talk to your students about the global um, aspect of Manifest Destiny and how diplomacy and foreign policy, uh, trade, you know, all of those things that are so important to our country, especially to our country's prosperity in the history of our nation. And uh, so that's a map that I provided you that sort of, you know, talks a little bit about that, you know, the Alaska purchases up there. And you, you can see those islands um, that are highlighted uh, that eventually became territorial possessions of the United States. And a lot of this happened over the course of the 19th century. So the way that you can think about incorporating the story of the first Japanese embassy is kind of as a prelude to the Mexican-American War, you know, sort of move away from Texas, think about the influence of California, why California would be such a important, um, you know, piece of of that entire conflict, you know, because of course it's the entryway to the Pacific. It's the entryway to that Pacific trade, which is thing, you know, that they there was almost, you know, an obsession about this. Also, if you want to um, use it as a backdrop to when you teach about the open door policy, or even um, thinking about teaching about Theodore Roosevelt and um, him as a diplomat and how he helped to negotiate the peace that ended the Russo-Japanese War in 1905. You know, there's many ways that you could you could think about this. And even if you wanted to uh, use it to introduce to your students the idea of the relationship of the United States and Japan um, before Pearl Harbor, you know, this is a way to sort of set the backdrop. So there's a lot of different ways that you can think about this. So let's just uh, drill down for a second. Um, Two guys, two, two grizzled guys, <laughs> right? Uh, President Millard Fillmore uh, and Commodore Matthew Perry. So the idea of, um, you know, they called it opening up, you know, trade in Japan. The idea of this, you know, had been floated around even as early as the 1830s and 1840s. And actually, I, I showed this picture to my colleagues this morning, like, you know, who else has a 
picture of John Tyler there, there at home. Uh, President John Tyler, he uh, came to the presidency after the death of William Henry Harrison um, in 1842. He uh, established the Tyler Doctrine. A lot of you may be familiar with the Monroe Doctrine, you know, this idea of, you know, keeping the Western powers out of the Western um, hemisphere, that this was like America's sphere, you know. But uh, Tyler and his Secretary of State, Daniel Webster, took a different approach to that. And they said, you know what, um, we're, we're going to stretch that doctrine just a little bit because the Pacific, that's, you know, really part of our hemisphere anyway. And so uh, they said, you know, the Sandwich Islands, which are now known as the Hawaiian Islands, they, they said, you know, we're going to keep Europe out of the Sandwich Islands, you know, because they saw this very much as the gateway to the lucrative um, Asian trade that I just mentioned before. So it was really during the Tyler administration in the early 1840s that they're kind of thinking about this, but they have one problem actually a few problems. Uh, first problem is, is that the Europeans had already broken into the China market. Um, they had uh, established concessions and ports. You know, the Americans were kind of latecomers to it. So uh, they were sort of benefiting from the fruits of the um, relations that the Europeans had already established. But what the Europeans had not been able to break into was the market with the Japanese. And so uh, President Fillmore in the early 1850s, he asked Commodore Matthew Perry, who's there on the right, to lead this uh, expedition, this expedition to go to Japan and to uh, deliver a letter written to the Emperor of Japan, um, basically saying, you know, we'd love to establish relations with you. We'd love to establish a trade with you. But, you know, their challenge was uh, the Japanese had rebuffed, you know, everything from the Western powers up until then. So, you know, they, they had to really think strategically about how they were, how they were going to accomplish this. Um, so in 1852, this is when Filmer appointed Perry to lead the expedition. Um, and just, just a tiny bit of background about why uh, the Japanese had been so secluded from the Westerners. They were operating under a 1636 act of seclusion. That's what they called it. Um, under the Tokugawa shogunate who ruled Japan from 1600 until 1868. So uh, a couple of hundred years, almost 300 years. And what that act of seclusion was in the government, uh, it was an official act that completely forbid any kind of diplomatic relations or trade relations with Western nations. The Japanese only traded with the Chinese and the Koreans, and they had a very limited um, uh, in exclusion in that for the Dutch East India Trading Company. And that's important to the story. Um, so the Dutch had a tiny little island um, uh, out in Nagasaki Harbor that they were allowed to trade out of. And I say that this is important, you know, for really uh, going back to the communication theme, because this was the only way that they were going to, uh, the Americans were going to be able to communicate with Japanese was through the Dutch, which is kind of interesting. So the Dutch were there, had a very small presence there. So they had a lot of challenges challenges. And the Japanese had taken the stance because they were very well aware what had happened to China. China's sovereignty had been overthrown. Uh, the Opium Wars had just concluded where, uh, you know, open warfare demanding trade. Um, so this was not something that they were particularly very interested in. So the Americans were going to have to distinguish themselves from the Europeans. So Fillmore writes at this letter, and, you know, one of the main concerns here at the time was American shipwrecked sailors. American sailors in the whaling industry was enormous at this time, mostly in the Pacific. And you had a lot of boats that were going down, sailors who were being shipwrecked on all these islands off the coast of Japan, and, you know, kind of languishing there. If they were lucky enough to be picked up by, by the Dutch, you know, who would return them to America, then they were okay. But the Japanese, uh, you know, at all, it just left them on those islands. So uh, part of, you know, Fillmore's, uh, you know, what he really wants is to establish relations and he really wants a trade agreement, you know, but he starts out uh, with this letter that was authored um, by his Secretary of State, then Edward Everett, 
uh, that, you know, using this idea of the sailors, you know, please be kind to our citizens and all that. And then he kind of you know, gets, gets into the meat of the matter. So he gives this letter to Perry and Perry sets off on his expedition and uh, he brings a lot of gifts with him, which I'll get to in a second. So this idea of gunboat diplomacy, this is, this is where that comes from because Perry didn't set off in uh, just regular uh, ships of the time. He set off in American naval gunboats, you know, fully armed gunboats. And uh, so they show up unannounced. I mean, unfortunately for the Japanese, like they'd been given a heads up because the Dutch knew about this. So uh, they were alarmed, but it wasn't entirely unexpected to have, you know, Perry and his flotilla of gunboats, you know, come into Tokyo Bay. And, uh, you know, they really didn't know what to expect. They had been warned, but they didn't know what to expect. So, you know, Perry and a couple of his guys, you know, they get on a boat and kind of row their way to shore where they're met by some Japanese officials. And uh, so it's, it's a pretty brief visit, um, no, no hostilities. You know, clearly, you know, the Japanese can see that they're, they're looking at gunboats. Um, and uh, so they know that this is not an entirely friendly visit. And, uh, you know, Perry, he really studied up. I, you know, you have to give him credit for that. He, he studied up on where a lot of the European nations had tried and failed in, in terms of uh, establishing a trade agreement. And he knew that the Japanese would be very methodical that they'd have to think about it. So uh, he has Fillmore's letter. And instead of just being like, okay, well, you know, here I am. He's got his Dutch interpreter, you know, who's interpreting for him. Uh, the Dutch is speaking Japanese and, you know, Perry's talking to this Dutch gentleman. So he doesn't just say like, well, I got this letter, this letter here. He puts it in a blue velvet box, like a beautiful blue velvet box with these gold tassels hanging off of it and says, oh, please, you know, present this to your, to your emperor and I'll be back. I'll be, I'll be back in a year. And, uh, Japanese say, well, okay, you know, we're going to give it some thought. So they take the letter and uh, Emperor looks it over with uh, the sh other shogunates and they say, look, uh, clearly they've outmatched us here, you know, with their gun technology. And, you know, there, there actually could be something in it for us. So when he comes back, like, let's do this, you know, and Perry returns uh, about a year later and, um, this is when he's going to show them the gifts. And this is really what distinguishes American diplomacy in Japan from the Europeans. Because the Europeans who had tried before and failed, uh, it, it wasn't all to do with the gifts that they presented, but um, it, it had a lot to do with it. For the Americans, this was a tipping point. The Europeans would often present like these very intricate clocks and art, watches, things like that. You know, the Japanese were like, yeah, we, we got art. Like, you know, we know about these things. Thank you. And all of that. The Americans brought technology. They brought practical things. Um, let me just read a little bit of, of what, they, what they brought. Um, firearms, very important, right? agricultural tools, uh, reports on weights and measures, which I always thought was kind of strange, but various reports about that. Um, reports about the American government, democracy, how it functions, voting, uh, the electoral college, you know, all of these things. Um, examples of flora and fauna from America, so a lot of, you know, scientific things. And then there was, there's two things that really stood out. Perry and his guys brought a fully operational locomotive, scaled down, but an actual steam powered locomotive that had an engine and a car and its own track. So you could see it hopefully there, that's, that's the locomotive in scale. And it ran around this circular track, you know? And they also brought a batter, two battery powered uh, telegraphs and it stretched three miles. So they were able to actually stretch that telegraph wire and show them how the telegraph work. The Japanese were just like, all right, <laughs> we got to have some of this, you know, and they determined, yes, commerce with the United States, you know, might be really mutually beneficial. And so they signed an agreement. And uh, a few years later, the first U.S. envoy went back uh, to do a general commercial treaty with the Japanese because the first uh, port opening had been so successful and the Japanese agreed. And so they drew up a treaty. And then, of course, the treaty has to go back to the United States, right? So uh, in 1860, a delegation of Japanese shogunates 
uh, with 77 of them in total, headed by three uh, ambassadors and vice ambassadors, got on some naval ships and spent uh, several weeks, uh, February, March, April, sailing across the Pacific and then to get to Washington. And I really love this photo. This was taken by Matthew Brady before Matthew Brady was anybody, right? Before anybody knew about him and his iconic photos taken during the Civil War. This is taken at the Navy Yard. And I love the, the disparity, you know, between these, you know, uh, shogunates in, the, in their full garb, you know, with their swords, you know, standing with the American naval guys, just a really interesting juxtaposition. So they arrive in Washington on May 14th, and uh, they're met by 5,000 uh, Americans, you know, Washington DC, just like freaking out. They're so excited to see the Japanese. And the Japanese are really taken aback by this. Uh, fortunately, we know a lot about what they were thinking during the time because one of the vice ambassadors kept a diary, a very detailed diary. And uh, so we have a lot of their perspective. So um, they were, uh, you know, taken aback by, by how absolutely um, unrestrained uh, the Americans were in trying to approach them. Uh, they talk about, you know, going in the carriage from the Navy Yard uh, to the Willard Hotel, which is where they would be staying. And people actually like sticking their hands inside the carriage and trying to get pieces of their of their um, clothing and all of that. So to them, this was this was just, you know, very odd, you know, the Americans in their in their exuberance. Um, so they know, uh, you know, that they're going to meet with American officials, you know, they don't really quite know what to expect. And um, so on their first meeting um, with American officials, they do get to meet Lewis Cass. That's Lewis Cass on the right. And they know that they're going to meet with the President of the United States in 1860. This was James Buchanan. But the title of Guess Who's the President uh, really fell to the, the Japanese. Now imagine them, you know, coming from their culture where it's very, very clear who the emperor is. There's very established protocol. And when they meet with Secretary of State Louis Cass, you, you know, they ask him through a Dutch interpreter once again, like, okay, so how do we approach your president? How, you know, and all of this. And he's just like, you know, do whatever you want. And, and they said, uh, could you give us a little bit more guidance on that? And he's like, no, 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 whatever, you know, do as you please. I think were the exact words, do, do as you please. And this makes them really uncomfortable and they're really embarrassed by this. So they go inside the executive mansion, the White House, back then it was called the executive mansion. They know they're going to meet the president of the United States and they enter into the room and they see a guy like that, like that picture. And then they see a guy, I don't know, like, like that. Right? See that guy dressed like that, right? Then they see somebody dressed like that. <laughs> you know, they see like a bunch of guys just uh, dressed in, in black. You know, there's no, nothing to distinguish who's the president of the United States. They are extremely taken aback by this. And so there's a moment of awkwardness until finally uh, Secretary Cass, you know, leads them over to President Buchanan and, you know, presents him as the president of the United States. So they're really taken aback by this in, in you know, informal manner of addressing the leader of the country. Um, their trip goes really well. They spend a number of weeks there, um, not quite a month, but about three weeks. And uh, that's a picture of um, the Japanese delegates there. And uh, let me read you off who they are. Ambassador Shimi uh, uh, Masaoki and is on the far left. And then uh, the gentleman who wrote the diary is ambassador, uh, Vice Ambassador Murugaki Nor Norimasa. And then another Vice Ambassador to the right of him, Ogori uh, Tadamasa is on the right. Um, and they always appeared, you know, in their, in, their, in their garb. They brought a lot of clothing with them. It's really important for them to show who they were, you know, to the American people and the American officials. And they also too brought a lot of gifts with them. Um, that picture on the right shows their hotel room at the Willard and sort of unpacking their gifts. While they were there in the United States, they visited so many places and, and they had their orders, you know, it wasn't just like, this is not a pleasure trip for you guys. Like you guys are, you know, you need to, we expect you to bring back a report here and we really want you to check out the size and the strength of their Navy and their technology. We want pictures, we want detailed reports of that. 
But for the Americans, they wanted to show them a good time. They wanted to show them the best of what was America. So, I mean, literally like every day they dragged them around to like four or five different places. They went to the patent office, they went to um, the Smithsonian, they went to different parks, they went to churches, they visited hospitals. They even took them to Congress and that absolutely horrified them because there were debates going on. And they said that everybody was screaming over each other, that nobody could be heard. And they even described it as being like a fish market, you know, just like completely appalled, you know, this is your government, like, how do you get anything done, you know? Um, but they were very interested when they went to the patent office. And then of course, when they went to the Navy Yard and they did ask a lot of questions about the size and the strength of the Navy. So uh, when, when they were about to depart, they weren't quite finished with um, their tour of America. They were about to depart to Philadelphia before they returned to Japan. And so they presented their gifts uh, to the president and a lot of other officials. And they brought these beautiful silks and porcelains, you know, part of diplomacy, even today, is when you give a gift, you want it to represent the best of what your country has to offer. You know, it's, it's very personal, very personalized. And the gifts that they did bring and presented were very personalized. So in return, uh, this is what the Japanese got. <laughs> they got a coin. Uh, which is kind of funny, but I think it, it goes back and reflects to sort of the, the simplicity, sort of like the plainness, you know, of all of it. And um, this is an item that's actually in our collection, the collection of the National Museum of American Diplomacy. We do have about 9,000 artifacts, and some of our artifacts are from the 19th century um, and the 18th century. And this is... Um, one of the coins, I, it wasn't one of the coins that was actually given to the Japanese uh, delegates, it, but because the coins were kind of presented all around. So the Japanese delegates got gold coins. Um, the item in our collection was most likely one uh, that was given to one of the naval officers who had participated in going back and forth um, between America and Japan. And But it's in this beautiful box and um, they were given this as a, as a presentation. And uh, they were really impressed by the speech that uh, Secretary of State Lewis Cass made when he was presenting this because he said, you know, we're so honored to have had you here. And this is for you and it's from the American people. You have been the guests of our nation. And that really impressed upon them the idea that, you know, it wasn't just like one sole person, a king, a monarch, you know, it was the nation. It was from the American people for the American people. And um, so that uh, trip was really a great success, except for the food part of it. You could read more about that online in the story, you know, and the Americans were just like throwing meat and butter at them and all of that stuff that they had a really hard time with. Um, but overall a success, the relationship was solid um, for so many years. And the Japanese were able to, uh, within the next couple of years, um, establish telegraph service. They also, in 1872, just a couple of years later, um, established rail service between um, Tokyo and Yokohama, which was about 20 miles. So picked it up very quickly. And um, the relationship would continue unabated, um, really, until 1941. And I think, you know, one of the ironies about all of this is this friend relationship and this exchange of ideas and culture and ideas and commerce um, eventually became in the 20th century a jockeying, you know, for control of the Pacific. So there's many ways that you can share this story with your students. And the last slide that I'm just going to show you really quickly, and this will be on Facebook Live, is, you know, just a few um, resources that you can look up on your own. I've got the link there that Lauren pointed out before. And of course, our contact is nomad at state.gov. So um, that's it for me. So Lauren, come back. All right. Well, Awesome. Thank you. I could listen to you and your stories of history forever. Thank you for sharing that. I am I'm left with the image of the unrestrained Americans <laughs> meeting the Japanese delegation as they were coming in through the Navy Yard. Uh, gotta love that and our enthusiasm as Americans. Um, all right, so that was great. Thank you very much. You know what? It kind of occurred to me too that with the information that you presented, and the information of um, 
in the diplomacy at a glance, that basic information about what US diplomats do, where they do it, why they do it. That's a nice compare and contrast to be able to look at how something was conducted in the 1860s and how we conduct things today. There might be some elements to see what's different, what's similar, what's changed. Yes, and the definition of protocol, proper yeah. protocol, right? And <laughs> proper protocol and proper meals. Right. Don't be throwing meat and butter. Okay. Um, before we go to questions, I want to reiterate um, that this is being recorded. The link will live on, so you can, if you needed to leave and you want to come back or what, or share this with colleagues, this this recording will be available for for um, for all. And that on our diplomacy at a glance resource page, there's a way for you to sign up to receive. Um, newsletters and notices of additional information that goes on to our website. So with that, shall we take a couple questions? Yeah. Cool. I see one that I think I will address, which is about our site visits. So clearly this is coming from someone who's in, in, in perhaps in DC and is able to bring students. We usually um, meet with students who are middle and high school. We also meet with a lot of community college and college students as well. All of that information about, typically we, we don't do a group more than 40 in size. Um, and if you go to the website and you go to that education tab and you drop down to that attend a program or you know area, um, there are, three or four different ways in which we can program a visit for you and the timing of those changes anywhere between an hour long visit of a tour of diplomacy is our mission to a diplomatic simulation program that we can host for you live on site. And yes, we do have um, a side room where we conduct class discussions with either Allison or myself or other staff members or diplomats who work within the State Department. So feel free to go to the website to see more. Um, and Allison, are you looking at the questions? I am, I'm kind of moving the screen around so I can, I can read them. There's, there's one I think about uh, the, uh, the, the Morocco being the first to recognize our US independence in 1777. You wanna look at that? I know that when, we, when we're gonna be opening our permanent museum exhibits or, or open fully, which will happen at the end of 2022, I think that was another question. Um, we are partially open now, so we do receive visitors in our museum now on an appointment basis mostly, but we also are open on Fridays. Not currently, just because of the whole COVID situation, but when we are open fully to the public in 2022, um, that's when you will see our fully thought, our, our fully, uh, you know, our permanent museum exhibits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, I, yeah, I appreciate that question for sure. Um, we are, you know, as Lauren said, we are working on our permanent exhibits. That's very much a big part of the story. We currently don't have anything on the site about that, but the way that we've been working um, is, you know, we continue to add, uh, you know, stories of diplomacy and historic uh, stories to the website, you know, before we can be open and images. So that is absolutely one that we do want to incorporate. But I, I think I would point that gentleman um, back to faces, Lauren, that he uh, can look at the basis of diplomacy um, because uh, Mr. Kane, who is standing um, outside that, that legation, yeah, that's, yeah right. that's the Moroccan right, of course. It's, yeah. it's a museum now. And uh, so, you know, that may be a way for you to share and explore uh, with your students, you know, to show the faces of diplomacy videos and, um, and then to actually go uh, to um, the website of, of that legation museum because they've got a, real, a lot of really mm -hmm. cool Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, great. How large of a group can we can be accommodated? It really depends on the kind of program that we that we create. Um, typically, we don't go larger than 40 at once. We have been known to do larger ones with some lots of coordination, just because of this, um, this the, the space constraints that we have. So if you can think about 40, we've had groups that say, well, we have 80 and then we've worked it out where we have 40 at once and the beauty of being located where we are on 
21st Street, right below Virginia Avenue, is that the Lincoln Memorial and the Vietnam Memorials are just to the south. So you can have perhaps group visiting the, the memorials and the monuments there, and then we can switch. So there's, there's ways to think creatively should your group be larger than 40. And is that it? I think that's all I see here. Um, I see um, from William. Oh. Uh, asked about how long does it take between the initial idea um, for the exhibit panel and the theme and the top and its final appearance. Um, yeah, it's a pretty long process. Um, so the way that I work um, is I research a story. I write out a very long narrative, um, you know, like a really complete narrative. And so, you know, depending on how much research I have to do that goes into that, you know, the, the write up could actually take a couple of weeks. And then at the museum, we do have an exhibit team. It's made up of a curatorial staff. Um, and so we sit down and, we, and we, we talk about the idea. And our diplomacy is our mission was uh, constructed and the design, the fabrication was done in uh, by Smithsonian um, institution exhibits. And so uh, we worked with the scriptwriter there. And that's kind of an essential link, you know, in thinking about panel text and all of that, because they are professionals who can pare down and really pull out the nuggets of the long story. And uh, so then you go through different review processes. And then, of course, you have to look at a variety of photographs that you want to use. You have to think about if you want to incorporate video, you know, what your capabilities are. So um, I'm trying to think of how long diplomacy is our mission took. I mean, because that was um, 12 stories, right? And then the intro panel, I guess it was about a about year. About a year, I would say. Yeah. 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 But fortunately, um, that particular exhibit, we're changing out some of the panels. And uh, so uh, we're being able to refresh the content inside there. And um, so just doing, you know, one story, it really depends to how quickly your fabricator can make the panels too. Um, so that could take anywhere from, I don't know, two to four months. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And um, I'm, I'm looking at the time and it's about four minutes till two. So I know we, we wanted to be kind of completed by two o'clock. So I, I would like to add that we plan on hosting more of these Facebook live events. We'll be able to dig deeper, like Allison offered an excellent um, uh, story about one of the stories that's in our Diplomacy is Our Mission online exhibit that's also um, in, our, in our museum. But we will be able to feature lots of the other pieces of content that we have featured on that resource page. So be monitoring our Facebook. If you're not, um, if you're not if you haven't liked and you haven't followed us, please do so you see when our next event will be, um, as well as our Twitter and our Instagram. Um, it's Nomad Museum, so you want to follow us on there as well, where we also will be hosting um, or, or placing announcements. Um, thank you, Brianne. We love our simulations too. Uh, more simulations will be offered as well. Yeah, so stay tuned for that. We're working on three historical ones that will debut hopefully within a year. Um, and um, there was someone said something about our historic donations. As Allison mentioned, we have over 9,000 objects in our collection and our artifact collection. And a lot of those have been gifted to us or donated to us from our uh, diplomats, both serving and retired diplomats. Um, so yes, yeah, so check out our, our page and get in touch with our curator should you have anything you want to share with us and a story that might go with it. And I think with that, I thank you so much for joining Allison and myself today. Um, we've had such a good time. Please follow us. Look forward to, the, to, to more programs that are soon to come. And um, let us know if you have any questions on the MAD at state.gov. Thank you so much. And happy Teacher Appreciation Week. Very much. Thank you, teachers out there, for all you do. All right. Bye. bye.